they've got a whole thing called buyer capitalism. They've been writing white papers about it. It's the next thing. That's what the great economic reset is about. It's about commodifying your very, the, the digital identity in every way possible. And the digital identity is, has always been around. It's not new. Welcome to the Cosmic Keys Podcast. This is going to be your episode for the week of January 11th, 2021 to January 17th, 2021. And on today's show, I have a great conversation coming up with host of the Interverse podcast, Chance Garden. This is Chance's second time coming on Cosmic Keys. And this time around, we have a really free flowing conversation all about the power of words We go off on a lot of different tangents, and it's just a really fun conversation. Chance has a great show, The Interverse Podcast, and if you are into the type of material we cover on this show, you're probably going to like what he covers on his show as well. So it's a great conversation. Definitely stick around for that. And if you do want to skip forward to that conversation, I always put the timestamps in the show notes so that you can skip this intro if you would like. So this week, I'm going to go light on the astrology. Um, I usually do my week ahead readings with the assistance of a calendar. For the past two years, definitely, I've been buying the Llewellyn astrology calendars. I used to buy them from a local occult bookstore in Chicago called Alchemy Arts, um, hope they're doing well there. But now that I live in like a little mountain town, I don't have a type of store to go to to buy that stuff. And when I tried to buy it from Amazon, it's actually sold out. So this is like a really hard item to buy. And I've I've been buying it every year. And yeah, it's the Llewellyn calendar. It's Llewellyn. It's not super advanced. It's really easy for me to visualize the week look at the transits and kind of improv my astrology readings every week. So I have my ephemeris in front of me here and I'm going to just kind of mention a few things, but this is going to be a shorter astrology reading for the week. So Uranus stationed direct after being retrograde for a few months. As I flip through the ephemeris, I can see that that Uranus uh, station retrograde in August on August fifteenth at ten degrees Taurus. That's ten degrees of the fixed signs, which is right on my ascendant. So Uranus has been activating my chart for a while. Um, so it's station retrograde back in August. Very chaotic, shaky time of my life, but it was damn. It was a good. It was Uranus in a good, good situation because, yeah, my life got shaken up, but it led to better things. So, and then speaking of Uranus, the other thing I want to mention that's happening this week is Jupiter in Aquarius is going to be squaring with Uranus in Taurus. So this week we have Uranus stationing direct. And then squaring with Jupiter. So expect the unexpected, expect shakeups, surprises, or shifts. And like I said, um, Uranus isn't always bad. And this is a year we're going to have to try to embrace the Uranian themes. Um, Try to focus on the positive side of shaking things up, awakening things up, uh, revolutionizing, and just kind of setting new things in motion, changing the pieces on the game board. That's what happens when Uranus is activated. And this Thursday, Uranus did station direct. So it's stationing direct at six degrees of Taurus. So activating that six degree axis of the fixed signs. 2021 is one of those uh, fixed sign years. So me being a very fixed sign person, I'm thinking about how it might hit me. Um, So that happened. But on the topic of Uranus, um, 
Mars is making his way towards Uranus as well over at the early degrees of Taurus. So when does Mars conjunct Uranus? That is going to be <laughs> right around January 20th, which I think is inauguration time. So just know that, you know, Mars being the planet of war, energy, ambition, confrontation, that Martian energy is going to blend with the rebellious, explosive, shake things up energy of Uranus. Mars has been also squaring off earlier on with Jupiter and Saturn, which were at, you know, the early degrees of Aquarius. And I am just looking at numbers on a page that says January 2021, looking at all the degrees of all the planets and trying to visualize this in my head. But yeah, a square happens when, um, you know, when two planets are in, or are in fixed signs in this case, and they're at the same degrees that causes either a square or an opposition. Um, and because Taurus and Aquarius are at 90 degree angles to each other, that is a square. So this energy is going to be hitting, you know, next week, but because this episode's coming out kind of late in the week, I thought I would throw that in. Um, but the new moon did occur this past week. I'm recording post new moon. And in fact, uh, when I was driving home from work, I saw the very faint crescent of the moon setting behind beautiful mountain um, silhouette. So it was a great sight to see. And whenever you see that, whenever you see the moon trailing behind the sun and that little first sliver near sunset, sunset, that indicates that we're at the beginning stages of the lunar cycle. Now, this new moon this past week took place at the location of the Saturn-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn. Um, I think it was at 23 degrees Capricorn. Um, so yeah, this, you know, the general energy of this new moon in Capricorn that happened this week is tense. It's, you know, close to Pluto. It's in that area that was so affected in 2020. So this this new moon is kicking off the 30-day lunar cycle. And so for the next month, it's it's going to like reflect the bad energy of 2020. Now I'm not saying the next month's going to be terrible, but we kind of talked about this already and other astrologers have talked about it too that the astrology of the beginning of this year is, is not great. Like this isn't a great year. It's not a happy go lucky year. There are some nice points of the year that happen later in the spring and into the summer, but we, we start the year off with this energy. We're starting the year off with this Uranian explosive energy. And this new moon has that plutonic energy as well. So, very brief, but that's kind of where we're at with the astrology. And surprise, it's time to announce the winner of the Key Tarot giveaway. So I announced that I was doing a giveaway during the uh, winter solstice, which was the two-year anniversary of Cosmic Keys. It took me a little while to sort of finish out this contest, but... Uh, it was an Instagram giveaway and everybody entered and I did select a winner. Now it's funny. I think this person has maybe already won one other time. And on top of that, they're probably the most, one of the most loyal listeners and fans of the show whom I chat with and am like online friends with. But they still won fair and square. I was honestly thinking like, oh, should I just give it to someone else? Oh, should blah, blah. No, they won fair and square. I randomly selected the winner. So 
the lucky winner of the Key Tarot 2021 two year birthday giveaway is Instagram user Heart of Pluto. She, like I said, loyal fan, so I'm very happy that she's going to be getting the deck. I've seen footage of the deck on social media, it looks real nice. Um, it's super high quality and gold and shiny and it took a lot of work to complete because I was a part of it by being a, a model for some of the cards. Uh, but it's great to see a creative project like that succeed, especially during a year like 2020 when shit hit the fan and anyways. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy to be given this to listener Miranda and um, keep an eye out for more giveaways. I think they're fun and I'm trying to engage the, uh, the listenership. And I also just want to say thank you for listening because truly I'm just grateful that I have an audience. Like if I didn't have any audience, I'd probably trail off and not keep doing this, but Man, I, I, I'm grateful that I have a podcast audience and y'all mean a lot to me. So thanks for listening. Anyways, stay tuned. We're going to go right into my interview with Chance Garten. You're going to love it. So stay tuned. right now i'm really excited to do this hell yeah me too it's it's been a while um i'm trying to think like the last i think the last time we swapped shows was like it was definitely in 2019 but it feels like a different world last time we <laughs> we got together right yeah like we've gone through some kind of era shift of some sort that does seem apparent to me um seems like it was planned as well and like a lot of big structural changes in the world coming about in synchronization with that nifty sky clock symbolism that you and i both are intrigued by yeah absolutely i i've i've seen so many things or <laughs> so many statuses be split in half i guess is the way of putting it so many dynamics broken into two pieces. It's like a mitosis or something that's going on in the cosmos. I don't know how else to describe it. Maybe it has something to do with the conjunctions going on this year. Maybe it was all sort of mapped out ahead of time by nefarious powers, nefarious powers. But uh, I, I want to talk about some of the political opinions that are out there right now <laughs> to be maybe not. Well, I, I want to hear it. what, your point of view because <clears throat> like I, I i was talking about this with another guest yesterday um about the division and about how the mask thing is somehow now a pro trump association you know and it sucks i can't tell you how many times i get that and i'm just like no uh no yeah and i know on your on your show but also on your social media with like the type of stuff you put on social media you're saying like it's all your your perspective seems to be that the two-party division is a trap and that like really don't even like don't even bother voting i don't know if i would go that far but like oh i would go like, that far yeah it seems like you have the perspective of like don't pick a side this is divide and conquer which i totally agree with and to what you were saying earlier, like about the person you were sort of 
debating about the mask issue. Like I'm trying to do that too. I'm really trying to like, as much as, as much as I'm sounding the alarm about like Marxism and stuff, I sort of want to like, at least talk to people that are openly for stuff like that, just to, to get out of this division for a, a second, you know? I, I, yeah, yeah, the key is don't debate. So in the situation I was referencing, it wasn't a debate. So I wasn't for something that she was against. Like we were just talking about why we do what we do. So that was real communication. And there's a, a, a really truism about the political situation in our country and really a lot of different lines of division, not just Republican, Democrat. I mean, this could apply to atheist and Christian, for example, or I mean, go pick your, pick your thing. But the, <laughs> the fact is we are rarely communicating with each other. We're not speaking to each other at all. We're just contradicting each other. And I think people that follow what I do, probably one thing I get a lot of feedback about is word stuff, like breaking down words, getting to etymology and original definitions or even legal definitions, which is a whole nother story. And it might be fun to talk about what the mask thing represents symbolically, legally, corporately. <laughs> I would, I'd kind of like to actually, but that we can save that for later. Uh, the fact is though, there's no communication going on. It's contradiction, which literally means like contradiction. Uh, it's against or opposing or nullifying words. So that's what these things are, like spells. Uh, the Everything that the two-party system fights about is completely, I'm sorry if this is upsetting to hear, but it's pointless. The same thing is going to happen that's going to happen. I promise. I... I <laughs> I really do. I know for a fact that like for the almost across the board, these, these creatures are in the same gene pool as in like family related. There's a lot of research on that. Just go down that rabbit hole. See if you're convinced. If you're not, it's, I'm not telling you it is or isn't true. I'm saying there's a, a very strong reason to assume that it's true when you look into the evidence and then also compare that to what we have of history, which is like, you know, the same families staying in power over generations because they inherit stuff and we don't, but like this contradiction thing, that's, it's a real word magic thing. Like this whole thing, this whole system that we're caught in is word magic that causes us to contradict our own self. And I'm going to give you the best example, the most mind blowing example. And it's, you have to be able to think poetically. You have to be able to think metaphorically or, and this is the trap that really, Materialist society should just be called literalist society because literalists are trapped in the definitions given to them by their own <laughs> sophistry, their, what they want something to be or what they think everyone else thinks it is. Neither of those have anything to do with what actually is. If they happen to overlap, then that's cool. But the example of, okay, so the example for... <laughs> a word that is completely antithetical to what we use it to mean is the word for F O R. And whether, you know, you think that it matters what definitions of words were when they were first being used or further back in time before our language was so badly corrupted, uh, whether or not you think that matters, you know, that's up to you. But for me, it makes perfect sense that we're going to have a lot of trouble getting anywhere truthful in our discourse or if we don't even have true definitions of words. And I know it's not possible for everyone to have the exact same understanding of words, but it, at least maybe we could start upgrading the way we communicate to each other to start off by defining at least some of the key terms. And then we might realize we mean the same thing, but we are using different terms. And that's great when we get to that point. But the word for, to get back to it, I'm going to read this from Webster's 1828 Dictionary of the American English Language. Okay, so this is what the word was meant to mean, regardless of what we use it to mean now. And in fact, the way they used it back then would sound a lot like how we use it now, but they would have 
a more poetic understanding of what it also means. So the word for, F-O-R, preposition, it is for corresponds in sense with the Latin pro, as for does with proe, but pro and proe are probably contracted from prod or proed. So, okay, why is this important? Uh, <laughs> the radical sense of for is to go, to pass, to advance, to reach, or stretch. But that is more in the etymological sense, all right? Uh, what, what does it mean in this dictionary, like after the etymological explanation? <laughs> now, number one, first definition for for in here reads, against, in the place of, as a substitute or equivalent, noting equal value or satisfactory compensation, either in barter and sale, in contract or in punishment. And Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for flocks and for the cattle of the herds. That is, according to the original, he gave them bread against horses. So why is this important? Why do we need to think about this poetically? Well, let's look at the two-party system, the most perfect example of how being for something, you're against it. You're for Trump. You're for Biden, okay? And then you go and vote. You cast your vote. And maybe we'll read the definition from this dictionary of what vote means, too, because it doesn't mean you selected anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> we should probably go to the Black's Law Dictionary or or a Bouvier's Congressional Law Dictionary to figure out that one. But yeah, maybe we will. But if you're for something, you're against it, think of the two pillars in masonry. And this is actually the church and state idea too. It's called controlled opposition, but it's not really recognized as that by the people who are involved in these, these uh, you know, collectivist type of mentalities. But when you go to vote, you vote for your guy and he wins or he doesn't win. If he doesn't win, you still voted that you think that the guy that does win should be your authority or, or should have the power to do all these things that they would never have actually had the natural right in nature to do. Because, I mean, you can't do those things. You don't have those rights inherently, God-given, universally. So why do you think that by voting you can say that this other guy or these people have that power? It's totally silly. But you're agreeing that even if the other guy wins, he should be the guy, even though you voted against it. So... You voted for your guy, you voted for against the other guy. Do you see what I'm trying to say here? Whether you voted for Trump or against Trump, you voted for the government. You voted against yourself. <laughs> These pillars hold each other up and cancel each other out perfectly. We're both pushing and leaning against this wall that we've built between these two parties and all these other different versions of division. We're leaning with all our strength and all our might because we're for it. We're pushing up against the wall, trying to you know, push the other side over or whatever, but they're doing the same thing in an exact equilibrium. It's the, oh, I mean, there's a lot of symbolism in masonry, but, and this isn't the only meaning of this symbol, but the, the Masonic arch, the Royal arch on top of representing the, you know, sky clock and that dome above, there's also this idea of the way that church and state lean against each other, create this false dichotomy, the way that now the two party system is used. It's a super old way of keeping people in serfdom, in slavery. And language is the number one way to do it. You keep somebody's language restricted to what they need to know to do their job and what will give them the sense that they have the best life they could possibly get. And then you've done it. You've put the seal on their imagination. And <laughs> But, okay, I'm going to just pass the mic back to you. But, like, you kind of get what I'm saying about for being against, like, it's, it cancels itself out. Like it's it's like a general accounting principles, as they call it. You have a debit and a credit. Credit, and because all of this money that we play monopoly with is fictional completely, at the end of the day, in that ledger, it amounts to zero. So if you're for Trump, you're for Biden. You're against Trump. You're against Biden. Same thing. It, it nets to zero. It's an account, basic accounting principles. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was a. Uh... That was a cool way to frame it. And I haven't even thought about, you know, what, well, I haven't thought about what a definition would sound like when you look up a preposition like for, but I'm, I'm following you because, you know, like you said, there's the, 
I can give you five dollars for a beer at a bar, um, but you, yeah, it's it's like an ex it's an exchange or a substitute, but then it's also if you're for something, you're showing support. So, and I liked the visual of you. Know, I, I'm with you on like the um, the dichotomies of all these things being for and against and. Um, yeah, the more I the more I talk to people about conspiracy or conspiracies and the idea of the elite or the controllers of society, the architects of our culture, like they're they're master um, they're masters at psychological ma manipulation and um, duality is super key to everything. It's su it, it's super key to war to conflict, but the whole divide and conquer thing is is literally their number one um, technique. It seems like, yeah, absolutely. And you know, the most important thing to realize here, I guess, if if anything, like the lesson that I just want humanity to learn really bad because, I mean, I'm still working on this lesson myself in a lot of different ways, and it's. It's a hard one. It's a really hard one, especially when you think about all the parts of your life that's going to affect. But <laughs> this might seem like it's coming out of left field, but you're not a thing. You're not a noun. That's it. You're not a noun. You're not a status. You're not a title. You're not whatever the membership name is of being a member of whatever group, whatever they would call you. <laughs> like if you were a fifth degree uh, Satanists in their, their like secret society, they call you a MAGA, M-A-G-A. <laughs> but anyway, any of these things, a citizen, a name, you're not a, none of that stuff, none of it. So whatever um, group that you identify with, whatever thing that you call yourself or things that you call yourself, start trying to pay attention to when you do it, when you mentally identify with a thing because this is really what's messing us up. This is the biggest, deepest rooted virus in the programming code that is our language. And I think on purpose and delivered to us by individuals that wanted us to see ourselves as property, property owners and property ourselves, masters and slaves and all that, things to be owned, commodities, capital per capita, per head, Human capital, biocapitalism, biocapitalism, by the way, look up that word, anybody uh, that wants to see what the <laughs> these elites, like I like to call them, uh, Saturnian priests, <laughs> money changers, they, uh, they've got a whole thing called biocapitalism. They've been writing white papers about it. It's the next thing. That's what the great economic reset is about. It's about commodifying your very, the, the digital identity in every way possible. And the digital identity is, has always been around. It's not new. Okay. It's like in the matrix when Neo gets uh, put back in the matrix for the first time, he's in the white room. He's like, well, my hair's back. I'm dressed all cool. And more is like, this is your digital identity. It's the mental projection of yourself, what you think you are. Well, this is what we're stuck in. This is like narcissists looking at his reflection and it's everything from our name to our, uh, you know, what we think we are, even like, a, <laughs> even calling ourselves a hue man, <laughs> a hue man. That's a good one. Uh, these are, these are antithetical to what nature is. Nature is an eternal process of becoming. So the being in human being we're so messed up that we've used that human being, like we're saying, a being that's a human. So like that the being itself is a noun. But being is not a noun. Being. It's a verb. It's something you're doing. It's an activity. And that's what life is. And you are what you are being in the moment. You are what you are. I am what I am, as that Jehovah character would say. And uh, it's a really important thing. And That'd be a fun term to define in this conversation too. Uh, it would probably get a lot of disagreement, Jeho defining the term Jehovah, but in a non-religious sense, it has a lot of deep meaning 
be worth getting into. But why this matters so much and why I've been going on and on about like, you're no thing, you're no thing, you're a verb, you're not a noun, is because as soon as we drop all that shit, the categories that we're dividing ourselves in throughout our human family would just evaporate. I mean, we might still have opinions and preferences, but we wouldn't take it so damn personally, uh, I don't think. I really don't. I think this is a, a super good trick that's been played on us. to identify, And it has everything to do with um, being born into a society where you're a citizen and you're registered with a, a legal name and like that's the digital, the original digital identity. But the future biocapitalism thing, it's going to be data driven. You're going deeper and deeper into the cartoon world, if you will. I, I, my big interest right now, I've been following a guy named Clint Richardson. Super amazing. Um, I don't think he's all that popular because I tell his name. Stuff, his name sounds air. really familiar. What What is he about? Uh, well, kind of what I'm about to be getting into and what I have been getting into, he's got so much writing and so much content. Like he's just a nonstop hustling researcher who probably became unpopular because he started using, uh, the like scriptures and things like that. And (laughs) non-literally, but very, but with very deep analysis of like how it explains our situation right now. And yeah, I mean, it's blowing my mind. I, this year was the year I finally understood what the Bible is uh, to the, uh, like a degree where it makes sense at all and I can interpret it. And that's cool. It has a lot to do with – it's like two, two-sided. It's this allegorical set of stories that refer to the sky clock and teach that part of the law of nature. And then it has everything to do with uh, this idea of personhood, the false ego, the noun that we attach ourselves to spiritually that – uh, is not the real us. It's that is like sort of the kill your ego thing. It's not that you don't have a healthy ego that is congruent with nature. It's that we don't identify with things that are fictional before things that are natural. And so, yeah, this Clint guy, he's taught me a lot of cool stuff and he's going to be back on my show soon. And I really want to get the ideas I've been uncovering from his work out to more people because it's kind of like, I really think this is the time where we can transition from believing things to knowing things. And that's crazy as that sounds like uh, <laughs> to go to the, okay. So I said, I mentioned defining the term Jehovah. Now don't, you know, don't shoot me for this. Don't lump me in with r- people that you know, that are religious or identify me as a noun or a title. I'm none of those things. So I'm not a Christian. I'm not X or Y or Z just, I am what I am, but Clint uh, attests to the idea that the word Jehovah actually means just simply the totality of all self-existent nature and reality, or what Christians would call the creation. And so there's this modern Christian doctrine that the creator is not in the creation, but outside and separate from it. And regardless, like this is not about, the only reason it has a name and it has any personification at all, this word Jehovah, It's simply so that we can know what we're talking about when we talk about the thing, which is what language is supposed to be. But if what the idea of Jehovah is, is the idea of the Lord or God or the guy in the clouds or Jesus Christ, it's we we are um, already in fetishism, (laughs) late stage fetishism. The end part of any civilization or culture is fetishism or idolatry. That's another fun word I'd love to go into, (laughs) what it means. But if we all would just like collectively go back to the definition for God or Jehovah as being just the self-existent nature of reality or the life force energy that animates all things and the something from nothing, no thing, nothing, no thing, Jehovah is not a noun. So that's already a problem if you're giving it a name. It's meant to be taken as a verb. (laughs) <laughs> it's a mm-hmm. process. It's the eternal state of being that is reality itself. So we've got ourselves into all these labels and titles and I'm an atheist. And if we really, if, okay. So like these elites and these, these uh, <laughs> politicians and secret society members, a lot of them probably know some of this stuff. I think some there's families that have kept this knowledge. I think that Americans had this knowledge about, what I'm talking about and uh, why America even came about kind of the way it did was try to get people away from 
serfdom, perhaps. I mean, I can't say that I know that. I wasn't there. The mythology, patriot mythology is crazy. But if we all had this definition of Jehovah or God as being just nature itself, self-existence, I think we'd be in a lot better uh, ability to discourse about God. But, you know, some people are still going to cling to the characterization of it as a an external being out there that's a noun <laughs> as a character mm-hmm. and that's that's a, a problem and anyway uh, i feel like i've been rambling a lot but this this is the very root of where we're at right now is that uh the reality principle is being corrupted by the artificiality principle so like reality is everything that was there and will be there without our intervention or our imagination and that's also synonymous for truth. That's what it means in that scripture when it says God is truth. That's the only way that I ever mean. What's the only thing I ever mean when I say God? I mean nothing else but truth, the state of what is. So there is that thing of reality that is there that we can all know is there just by the fact that we're in it. We're a property of it. We're part of it as in an expression of it, something it is doing. But uh, what humanity has currently been engaged with for a long time is worshiping idols or fictions, things that aren't real images, ourself as an image even. And that, uh, that's what is destroying nature. Like it's as simple as just thinking about the word resource. Okay. So you have source, which is nature. It is already there, self-existent, and it has a bunch of properties or materials or things that it expresses, things that are there and true and real. They're all part of source. You call it source. And then humans come along and they say, oh, all of that thing, that particular type of wood or whatever, we've named it. So there's the first step of domination, (laughs) naming it. And then we say, these are now resources. And it's not source anymore. It's a resource. And because it's a resource, it is no longer part of the uh, uncorruptible eternal nature. It is man's property and i mean that's where things begin to go wrong right there i'm not saying we can't work in nature we can't use source to build things and create art and have and that artificiality itself is evil no artificiality itself is not evil but all things evil are artificial and that's important it's uh evil can't actually create anything it can only invert life live backwards is evil Okay, so everything that we do that is against the laws of nature, the the self-evident harmony of existence, uh, that is evil. And that's all we need to do to define evil. But as soon as we do that, oh, shit, all of us are now in a whole lot of evil. Like we're all involved with a whole lot of evil. Uh Oh, so it's really not fun for people to like get on this train of thought and go all the way to like, okay, truth is simple. It's actually just what is. It's like self is self existing reality, and evil is everything that inverts reality or corrupts reality, um, and you know prevents the expression of life force uh, is artificial in a destructive way. So it's that. Yeah. Like, to, that's <clears throat> well, what this year is for me. Is like that was surviving this year was that was getting to that point, and it's what. I, <laughs> and it's also like. Damn, now there's a big cliff in front of me, it feels like, because how do I now find a way to disentangle from all of that evil? I'm with everybody out there. Like I'm part of all this matrix system bullshit. Yeah, I mean the the themes that you just kind of closed out on, like uh inversion and artificiality, these are buzzwords that keep coming up on the show because I mean we can see how many things are inverted at the moment, like how um, even just the basic right left paradigm is kind of flipped on its head right now because um, the, the lefties used to be the ones that were more about liberty and rights and freedoms. And the, the right was more about control and restriction, but that's inverted. And then, um, so many things with this, these narratives that are being spun and weaved are just inversions too. It's, it's literally like up is down, left is right. And good is bad. Bad is good. So yeah. And the artificiality thing too. I mean, so many more things every single day are becoming more artificial. Our interactions with each other are more artificial. Our, 
our food is more artificial and it's, and I like that you bring up natural law a lot when you speak, because like, yeah, the, the, the idea of nature is also when you think about natural law, just sort of like, like what you were saying, like the idea of God, God is in nature and laws are made in reality. But when you have people out there who are using these inversions of words and weird word magic, like black word magic, um, they're, they're creating a uh, fake reality. And then when we see fake reality on like social media every day, it's like when we stare into our phones, we are sort of like war brought into this warped reality where things are inverted and language is, is super important with it too. Like I think, I mean, I don't mean to be political, but it's more of like the Marxist crowd when they have these phrases, like, like silence is violence. Like, like they have all of these like weird word plays that don't make any sense, but they add to their overall like inverted false reality, which is like, like you were saying, like man-made versus like what's already here, what, how things exist in nature versus how things exist in our imagination or like in our, and, and just our imaginations are being projected into social media and stuff where like the things on in this, in our phones are just as inverted. Yeah, dude, you're, our imagination has been colonized. That's like the final frontier or maybe it was ever only the only one that there ever was to colonize was the imagination because human beings that could imagine a different life for themselves uh, would probably not stay in slavery for very long. <laughs> I think historically that's probably proved to be evident, but so here's an unpopular idea, <laughs> very unpopular idea. So, you know, forgive me, everybody. Forgiveness is important. I want to talk about that. But yeah, uh, equality doesn't exist in nature other than one. The only way that equality exists in nature is that nature is priceless, priceless. Nothing has a, an artificially affixed value to it. But that's what this entire matrix is based on is artificially designated and believed in valuation, right? And that's the art of, that's like the real deep root of why money is the root of all evil is because you're putting a false valuation on something, which is like a filter that turns something that was true into a cartoon or a lie, like the resource word, turning something from nature into a, a commodity like that. And so that's only happening because there's a valuation on it, like the trees you're chopping down are worth X amount of silver coins or, or whatever. Okay. So that's we're really going that's where we're going wrong it, i really think it is i think that's where we went wrong a long time ago and that's a big part of the mind virus is this valuation thing and then because this system of arbitrary valuation is always manipulated by the people who've got more value because they can use that value to manipulate things and you know it's always going to be musical chairs haves and have nots uh, it's just by design, master and slave is built in as a dynamic here. And having uh, the idea that there's no equality in nature doesn't mean, obviously, that we aren't equal under the eyes of the creator or in God or in nature. It just means that the concept, the concept of equality is man-made and fictional. It just is. I'm sorry if it hurts your feelings. Please try to hear me out on it, though, okay? Because... The only things that you're equalizing in society are statuses. So like women's rights are, I'm sorry, but it's actually being for women's rights is being against women's rights. And here's why, because as soon as you said, I'm a woman and different category than the man who has rights, well, there's why you don't have equal rights because you said I'm a woman. I'm not saying there's not males and females. There are. But uh, <laughs> woman is a legal status. 
It actually is just like your race and ethnicity and all that nationality and place of domicile. All these things are legal statuses that are attached to your cartoon digital identity. And, you know, if you look at I know there are some animals where they have a male and female, different word for the animal. Great. Okay. So we're, we're a species like that, I suppose. But would you not say that a, a mare and a stallion are a, both a horse? So why is it not okay to say that we're all men, like male and female men? And then instantly, even though we're still using a, a descriptive word, just like you use nature to describe reality or Jehovah to describe God or, or any of that stuff. Yeah, we're still using a descriptive word, but we've, con we've consolidated what we mean by that word. When we say men, we just mean all of the, the family of, of male and female men. And it's okay. It doesn't make you less that we're all men, right? It's the same thing. It's, we're the same species, right? So all the different, different categorizations of, of uh, types of men, whether it be along, like just, you know, you name it. 2020, we've never had more different titles that you can take and descriptions that you can pretend to be and, and nouns and statuses and bullshit. Like it applies to everything though. And so uh, like, you're not a husband, you're not a wife, you're not a boyfriend, you're not a girlfriend, you're not a thing. Be no thing. You are what you are. It's like, this is the real freedom. This is what, <laughs> this is how we get an enlightened society but uh we we can't have this idea of equality legally speaking without all these fake categorizations and just the same and in just the same way we put the different values uh solipsistically on these different statuses like i like republicans but i hate democrats or or whatever like i you you name it right so there's valuing people based on a false status just like you value the resource based on uh, a, a fictional arbitrarily decided fictional value that doesn't exist in priceless nature. So this is all to tie back to this forgiveness idea. Kryptonite, the matrix is kryptonite is forgiveness because the whole system runs on debt. Every dollar bill that's printed is attached to debt. It, the, you can't ever actually make enough money to pay off all the debts in the system. Therefore more money must always be created. Therefore there will always be poverty because some people can hoard money and there's never even enough for everyone to not be in debt. So guaranteed, guaranteed inequality, guaranteed, because we're using this fictional set of statuses and titles and valuations to even try to create as a basis of equality underneath that somehow. It's impossible. It's impossible. But if everybody forgave everyone, I mean, financially on a debt level, and instead of playing this game of commerce, which is war actually it's uh, ruled by mars that's a whole other story maybe that'd be fun to talk about maybe that's what i'll talk to you about on my show is like mars stuff and how it relates to commerce that'd be pretty fun but uh it's a game of monopoly right but it's a commercial warfare where like you're trying to get what you can get out of other people and if you can upcharge and get the higher margin and yada 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 you know what they call it when they used to call it when uh you bought a lot of of a same good and then you marked up the price they called you a grocer and it was just like calling someone a user it was a dirty word it meant that you were a, a fucking shithead you were gross that's why we call things gross now we have grocery stores like it's just no big deal now you get your home loan and it's you no know, big deal 20 percent interest rate no big deal 20 percent usury no big deal whatever but these were ideas that would like you know, you would you couldn't do this in, in certain places in the, in the ancient world because they knew it was evil. They knew it was bad. They knew that it was satanic. Sat <laughs> satanic is adversarial. It's the adversary. It's the it has it has a sky clock meaning too. It's the adversary to where the sun is, the opposite sign, the shaitan. But it's also if the universe is God, is truth, is reality, then what is adversarial to that? Adverse. See, universe, adverse. Satan, Jehovah, adversary, creator, right? What is adverse to truth and reality is artificiality. That's the whole thing. That's the whole thing. So, ah, man, that was a big stream of consciousness, but I really think like these are the ideas that humanity needs to, to not be in a really dark, 
Kronos ruled Aquarian future Kali Yuga. And to, to wrap up the idea about the Kali Yuga, I have no idea. I've heard so many different ways of calculating this and that. And, you know, we are only going to be here as long as we're going to be here to see what we're going to see. And maybe this is the time in history where we could actually start applying some good observational recording of sky clock stuff in a few hundred years have a better idea of what's up. But uh, I try to just, I'm trying to, I'm, it's so hard. I'm trying to disentangle myself from stuff I believe and, and information and just try to get stuff I can, I can know. And uh, to, natural law is that it's conscience, con science, knowing together to con with or together science, scary to know knowledge conscience is self-evident you know right and wrong in your heart instantly that's what that's what natural law is to simplify it all it's uh what you know self-evidently that's why it is the unwritten unspoken law the logos yeah well yeah all the wordplay too is reminding me of the psychedelic experience for sure too because that's the type of thing when a group of people is sitting there tripping, you know, the, the, the meaning like words kind of drip apart and people observe the etymology of it. Like the people, when you talk, when you're talking, when you're tripping, you do just, you do, you do kind of what you're doing right now. You know, you kind of like break the words apart and stuff. And it's reminding me of, you know, I must be permanently it, tripping. <laughs> It's not a I haven't done thing. psychedelics for years, but I do trip often. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it just reminds me of like the, the, um, I mean, it's, it's really interesting, but I mean, I, I think about those things more when I'm tripping, you know, you, you, because things split open and melt basically. And, and like they, the, it's deconstructive and, um, the I'm, substance and, comes out of the form, the uh, container breaks and then what was inside comes outside. Yeah. And even when you were talking, well, to bring it back to the game analogy um, and the like Kronos and all that stuff, and ta you're talking about like forgiving debts and all of that. And this, this debt game, this big game, um, I can't help but think of the, the great reset because I mean, that's, that's this program. I don't want to call it a program. That's this big picture idea. That's promoted by the world economic forum and it's, it's the like, inversion of the natural law in my opinion but yeah but it's it, the inversion I, of forgiveness I, but but yeah i don't think it's forgiving but i'm just saying like in the sense of it of all of this being a game of monopoly like they are being like we're hitting the reset button and we're starting a new game so even just like the choosing of that as the phrasing of it i think Re, like reinforces the idea that this is all monopoly money and this is a game and it's it's a rigged game you know you've seen the guy that is like coined that term and is going around telling everyone about the great reset and he wrote a book about it klaus schwab or something i've seen Just his go his look up his pictures head, of him yeah. and his go, google that guy klaus schwab and just like um black robes and stuff there's he's in all kinds of weird organizations he wears weird priest clothes like this is not a joke like these people are part of secret societies and orders and they they're he's not just like popular out there with these ideas because uh he works so hard and you know he's such a good economist or whatever God, people like that they're in this club it's been around a long time they're elites elites l being a word for uh, that is actually related to Saturn, uh, interestingly enough, but also connected to the Elohim, which is a word that was taken out of people's Bibles uh, whenever it was translated <laughs> to English, and it was turned into uh, God. I'm, I'm sorry, I just I just Googled, or I guess Duck Duck. I, I I did find a weird outfit that that this Klaus guy is wearing. Yeah, yeah. It's, he's they're, wearing they're... like a he's wearing like a star wars shirt or something yeah, they're but, satanists but satanists as an adversarial to nature i mean it doesn't mean what people think it means there is no satan satan can't exist because the concept of being adversarial to reality is non-existence or non-reality so right there <laughs> there's no satan boom can't exist by by what it means like what it's representing it literally can't so it's only something in our minds and then we act on 
on the belief or the fear of of whatever and then we do the adversarial thing to nature we're our we're our own worst enemy as they say and we're possessed because we think we possess so much but we're actually everything that we think is our property we're actually a property with it of something that's nature i don't know it's all making sense <laughs> yeah i mean there's i'm i'm all about it i'm i'm letting you you rant because there's you know there's a lot of stuff there's a lot of um ideas kind of swirling but there's um you know it's i it, it's it's since i i'm totally with you that language is their number one um tool of creating reality and and that is that is word magic too like that is um you know magic spells were were just words really words being used and crafted and um every it's it's just so it's so prevalent in in 2020 and another thing that i was that i that you got me thinking too of when you were talking about how we are not um nouns and everything and we're not these titles um the it, it i couldn't help but just think of stupid social media bios and just the the gut level cringe you get the cartoon from, yeah because i mean people i mean you can just see it like you you see people you think are are cool that you know in real life and then you follow them on social media and then you don't realize that they're like you know it's like consultant like creative wanderer like all of these like cringy like titles and and it's like it's just in your face these days with social media I, I prefer to have my tagline or about page be like, you know, cryptic and uh, heady. So on, on my Facebook, underneath my name, it says my about or whatever. It says once, unde once undefined, you may find your mind refined. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's exactly what we're talking about, actually, undefined, because nature is ambiguous god is strange as they say and uh truth is a stranger to fiction and truth is str stranger than fiction as they say it's stranger to fiction because uh you can't actually define the all it would be impossible it's undefinable it's uh it's as soon as you try to put a category on it, a definition on it, it's limiting the infinite, right? And nature is much, nature is ambiguous in all ways. You see a tree, the tree is not named tree. It's also not named Jim. It's not named John. It has no name other than if you named it, but not in nature. In nature, it is not defined as such. It is an ambiguous tree amongst thousands of others, just like the deer that you see is ambiguous. And that's like, that's actually what we were at some point, I think. Wouldn't we have been? Wouldn't we have been ambiguously existing just men in nature? And, you know, I'm not against technology. The word technology means art. So I'm, I love art. And uh, I'm not as hardcore as Clint of being, like, totally against everything artificial. <laughs> Clint, Clint has taught me a lot, though. A lot of these ideas uh, – I was able to reach because he would point me in the direction of like, just look at this word. Can you believe this shit? And then I'm now he's one of many mentors that's helped me with, with the word magic side of things and particularly the legal word magic. He's got that down, but right. So a deer is not named Charles. It doesn't have a definition. It is just simply what it is. And it's a process that is moving through nature, like a waveform. It comes into life and it returns to the dust. Right. And that's, ambiguous right it's undefined so that's what we are no matter what we pretend to be and we can pretend all we want and we will continue to pretend but if we pretend to be things that we aren't and believe that we're things that we aren't and act like things that we aren't and we corrupt our own nature it's gonna hurt I mean, I know because I've hurt myself in my life by corrupting my own nature in different ways. And 
still in some ways doing it and i want to heal from all that i want to get back to wholeness i want to play a different game for sure you know i don't think that we have to get rid of all artificiality art is cool but like it's alchemy art good art is alchemy it can exalt nature but it's harm it's harmonious like when two sounds are harmonious it creates almost an overtone that's that's new think of it like free energy it's almost like you're creating something out of nothing with this resonance and we can get into resonance with the biofield of nature around us, but that's like really hard in 2020 where the uh, you have to really go a far away to even get out of the blanketing of EMF and smog, right? So that's why I well, really think it's probably the, the best move to try to, to try to leave, to try to dip uh, some way. But it's tricky because like technically all the land is owned by the state, even one – even land that you have a deed to or a title, it's just you're you're entitled to it, but you're not the uh, loyal owner, the, st- the the land holder, the people that is described as we the people in that uh, that document that everyone loves. <laughs> Capital P people, capitalized letters in legal terminology represent a undefined term that will only take on the meaning that it is defined to have by the writers so like when you say we the people capital letter p that ain't us that doesn't mean all the people it's a specific group of people i'll leave that up to you to like go find out who the people are but it's a family <laughs> well to to i don't know if you've ever heard of um i i think his name's julian james it's like the he wrote a book it was like the breakdown of the bicameral mind yeah, I've heard people tell me it's to read that re- every I mean a lot of what you're talking about reminds me of that and his I I was I read it's like a thick book and I read it off probably like 6 years ago but and the, I don't know if I don't watch I I don't follow the show Westworld but they reference it a lot in rest in Westworld um but his argument which which makes me think of what you've been talking about like his argument was that man used to have more of a a abstract or sort of metaphorical view of reality and that's what the gods were so rather than um like and and he was saying that in this like and that's sort of like a more ancient way that man interacted with reality was this sort of right-brained metaphorical like otherworldly fantasy or not fantasy but like imaginal experience of gods and voices in their head and they were just sort of like being pushed around by the whims of like the unconscious more and then when man um there was something that happened like a cataclysm or like some kind of trauma in the human story that is referenced in like the the garden of Eden story. It's referenced in a lot of like biblical stories of trans split humanity in two and they were hermaphrodites and then they had gender. It's kind of a good metaphor for that. Well, he was talking more about like, like being expelled from the garden of Eden was, was coming up with an ego and, and, and the sense of I, the sense of me, like he was, his argument was that ancient man was just sort of at the whim of the gods above and being pushed around by the gods who were more powerful and they had no sense of self, but that was actually more of a blissful state. And the more difficult state is having this left brain perspective. That's like, uh, that names things like, like even with like Adam in the garden of eating, naming things. And he was saying that like the entire trauma of existence is like that some at a certain point our brain split and then we had this ego that was sort of born and you don't you don't live in harmony with the gods anymore you're just kind of like more egocentric and naming things and identifying as a thing which is what 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 you were saying made me think of all that that he wrote about I find that very interesting and there's a there's a lot of other ways we could consider what the gods might have been as well which is that that might be a fun thing to flow into but I I see I see it as a good thing to have 
uh, the bicameral mind, actually, in my opinion. I, I actually, I don't know that it was a, a bad move for humanity if, if we really did have, because like, look, if you're only in the right brain state, that doesn't mean that the, if you're only in sort of the subjective, does that mean the objective doesn't exist? Like if you're dreaming and not aware of yourself in the dream and you're just like in it, the way that happens to most of us most nights when we're not lucid, um, how long do you want to stay that way? Like, would you, would you feel good about that? <laughs> if, if I told you, yep, you're going to sleep tonight and you're going to be stuck in a never ending dream loop forever and never remember that you're aware of yourself. So like, you know, you would be blissful, but ignorance is bliss. As they say, you're ignoring the, the, uh, capacity of consciousness in, in that state. So maybe it's more of like, uh, maybe there was a divide at that point already, but humans were just really left, were really right-brained. And like maybe now the pendulum has swung and we're really left-brained and we're trying to get back to the middle. But I, I do think, I like this ability to introspect and also have an external reality to interact with. The thing is, it does lead to our suffering, like you said, um, because now we can choose to go against our own nature. And when, if we were just totally living at the whims of doing what feels right uh, and never going past that, you know, we'd just be like walking around the Garden of Eden, munching on whatever things were easy to just grab. I mean, probably wouldn't be chasing down food to kill it and eat it or anything like that. So, and, and, Considering the fractal nature of the cosmos itself, uh, at least the observable fractality of things, in my opinion, and uh, my psychedelic experiences have definitely shown me some serious fractality. But if that's, if that's a truism, it, it's a worthy thought experiment to wonder that if you were in a totally right brain dominant or maybe no schism at all, maybe just completely, but maybe the conscious mind is not non-existent, completely unconscious in the flow of nature, state of being. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I kind of lost the train of thought there, but like you would, you wouldn't care that you were like that, but if you had the option of being the other way, you would not want to go back to being unconscious, I guess. I don't know. I kind of lost my thread there. I, I hope that there's somewhere for you to pick up. <laughs> no, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm doing a bad job of of summarizing this. It's like, tripping me out in mid-conversation. -con I'm just like, this is so... Oh, you know, okay, here it is. It came back to me. Sorry. Let me just finish it out. It's like one, one thought that was supposed to tie it all together. The... Uh, universe being fractal if we're in that right brain mode totally in the like just everything's cool just doing what feels good would maybe the universe itself or the external reality reconfigure itself to uh, be appropriate for that like the garden of eden everything is the garden of eden <laughs> you have just plenty plenty of food everywhere there's no like work that needs to be done nature supports you you just lean into it and it leans back into you and like you know predators don't really need to do predatory stuff like everybody's got whatever in a balanced harmonious way nobody suffers right so maybe even animals did eat each other but they didn't suffer through it i mean maybe animals don't they appear to suffer to me now but my point is that who knows the fractal nature of things like could be that if we really brought our hemispheres into a equilibrium, it would nullify sort of like that accounting thing, <laughs> debits and credits. Like, I, I don't know. I really don't know. But I do know that in my most far out astral, psychedelic, out of body experiences, the sense of meanness never went away. So to even conjecture a reality where there's no sense of me, because even when I didn't know who me was or what I was or what my name was, and I was totally ambiguous to myself, I still felt that I existed. And that's I am. So I don't think that can actually go away. But I do think that humanity can become more roboticized. And I, and I do think that that's what it means to be like spiritually dead or unregenerate or whatever these words you could use for it. And that a lot of us have been in parts of our life more dead than alive spiritually and then therefore more roboticized that 
programmable, kind of back to what we talked about at the, the beginning there. But yeah, it's an interesting idea. The, but I don't necessarily believe because I haven't. There's, you shouldn't just believe things, and I don't see how anyone could believe what is presented to us as evidence about many different archaeological, historical, scientific things. But I, I just don't. I don't believe that we evolved from something lower, uh, some lower life form, any more than I believe that we evolved from some higher life form. I mean, who knows? <laughs> That's I get that there's like supposed evidence out there for that, but I will find you evidence that contradicts everything that you're for. And you could probably find evidence that contradicted anything I was for because to be for is to be against. And it's all information, information. It's all terms of art of different types of professions and sciences and, and therefore not actually derived from nature because it's, you know, our language constructs and we're always going to be able to contradict. So that's why I just want to like <laughs> try to get, try to get to that like mythical utopia, which just means good garden. Dystopia means bad garden, topiary. <laughs> just want to get to that good garden somewhere at, in the timeline of this particular existence. And I know that I won't get there if I run on the hamster wheel. So that's what the time thing is about. Like I'm going to have to take the leap into being supported by the charity of nature itself in some way. And other people are, are nature. So, you know, things that, when you when you make the leap, that's when you learn to fly. Like they say, the bird's got to do it at some point for the first time. I'm hoping that that's hoping this is my time. I'm hoping the the breakdown that was 2020 was absolutely worth it for me to like send me into my next phase. That's what I'm that's what I'm trying to do anyway. I think that's what the overall message for this year should be. That like, look. There's some kind of epochal shift going on. There's some kind of sea level change. Things are going into the air. Things are up in the air, <laughs> Aquarian. <laughs> uh, is the next version of your life going to be one that was dictated to you from an external source, or is it going to be one that you that you created? Because the creator controls, and if you are a character in someone else's cartoon, then they're your god. Oh, and that's the last. Well, one of the last things I, I left out was like, I kind of started to go there, but in the Bible, there's this Elohim word and then there's the Jehovah word, but in the KJV and most of the English translations, it's just called God or Lord. Ironically, in, uh, I think Sumerian, the word Baal, B-A apostrophe A-L is, it means Lord. <laughs> so when you're calling Jehovah Lord, which is a title, a noun, uh, you're, Worshiping Baal, which is like the bad guy in the Old Testament. Ha <laughs> ha. That's another that's a funny joke they played on us. But the uh <laughs> Oh man, I'm sorry. Where was I? Let's see here. Well we're kind we're kind of getting towards the end here, and I I'm thinking what is your advice or what's your plan for the near future given the state of the world and like you said you don't want to keep riding on the hamster wheel like where how do you uh how do you do that well i mean on a financial realistic level i'm gonna have to do i'm gonna have to try harder like if i'm gonna work for myself only that means it's gonna entail a lot of different types of freelance work and but that's gonna develop skills that in a repetitive job in an office like i'm not developing i'm just doing the same thing every day so that there's also going to be the hopefully the support of more people online who want me to keep doing this as my main thing. And that would be great. You know, we'll, we'll just see where it goes. But, uh, I do, I do have a good network of people I know around the country now and in my area. And I just think that even if it didn't, even if I end up like not owning a house anymore or, or whatever, this is okay. I mean, eventually <laughs> all things, <laughs> All things uh, change and end, and like I'm just gonna see like how far I have to strip down uh, the complexity of my life to make it work. We'll just have to see about that. But um, advice-wise, I think the the most important advice is to stop identifying as things to uh, 
look for the the being part of yourself that's the eternal part of yourself i know it's all kind of like cliche stuff but hopefully we've given new light to to uh terms and definitions that are not quite so self-evident when used by a lot of us so i don't know we're we're all only able to know what is best for our own path right like so i (laughs) unfortunately I don't know what would be the best advice for anyone out there because you all have different situations. Uh, but let's just stop loving and believing in things that are bad for us. Let's stop being for things that have any evil in them. You know, like the lesser of two evils thing. You're you're for Creepy Joe because Swamp Thing is so terrible to you or you're for Swamp Thing because you don't want the socialists to get in there. You're for government is what you're for. That's what you're standing up against. It's what you're propping up and holding up. And all of us are. And, uh, but don't take, you know, for a while I styled myself as an anarchist. Don't take that title either, man. Just don't even take it because it's going to turn some people off to you. Uh, They're going to have their own definition of the word. You're going to have your own definition of the word. And at the end of the day, you can never have no ruler. There's only ever one ruler, which is nature. That's always the ruler. Uh, Reality is the truth. It's always going to exist. So you can't actually be in a state of anarchy. And really, (laughs) ironically, that's kind of what government is, is uh, I've realized government is sanctioned anarchy or licensed anarchy. And what I mean by that is if anarchy means no rulers, then the only ruler or sovereign is God or nature, you know, truth then if you want to go against something like say have a license to kill like uh, soldiers or sometimes police officers might be able to do and get away with because they have the right title that that is basically you've licensed them to do something they didn't have the right to do or like you know this applies to everyone in any position of authority in reality that we've pretended has rights that normal people don't have it's just you can't actually you can't actually do that so we need to stop stop believing in those type of rights that we can invest them in other people i really think we got to stop doing that we uh, we have to stop looking to the external for the answer of right and wrong and what to believe or what to love and start only really going by like what's self-evidently lovable (laughs) what's self-evidently believable like what where start there just build from there because it it's like they always say truth is a frequency but if you strip down your meaning and definition of truth to just that which self-evidently exists the animating force of reality itself that's a lot of words but i'm just trying to paint a picture metaphorically or poetically of like you know, the pleroma, the all, if that's, if you just make that your truth, it's very freeing in a way. And it lets you just like go, okay, I know what's, I know what's that. And I know what's made artificially. And once you have that, then you can like actually judge whether the thing that's artificial is good or bad for you. Right. Like, I don't know. I I think it's, it should be as simple as that for all of us. I think like you could help a child, a child could be made to understand that. And I think that's, I hope that a child could be made to understand that. I know that a lot of grown up children probably wouldn't want to understand that because we're all really, really attached to things, things, (laughs) statuses, beliefs. I know I am like all kinds of things I've been attached to in my life. Relationship attachments are the one that's always hurt me the most. Like, expectations put on others because we have this title of boyfriend or girlfriend or this or that and so it's setting up everyone to get hurt (laughs) and that charity true charity is would be like that in the present moment we are just that good to each other anyway not because we have like the title of family members or the responsibility as like a you know therapist that's the title like that you go to them for to, to talk things out or to feel better about things like we the, the only real charity we can give is ourselves you know since money in general accounting debits and credits it all nets to zero actually it's negative because it's got all that debt attached to it 
uh, I think that's the best place we could do. Don't the best place we could leave people is like, don't let 2020 keep you from giving yourself to people. Don't let all this deep division, keep you from giving yourself to others in a charitable way, you know, not to give when your cup is empty, fill that cup first, take care of yourself, of course. And the fractal universe, the fractal nature will reflect that with healthier, th- uh, healthier actions, <laughs> verbs coming your way, other beings and, and uh, experiences. I don't know. I, I, I'm hopeful, honestly. I, as much as uh, the bad stuff that's going on is is really wild, it's all voluntary. Once you know that, you can start figuring out how to stop volunteering. And it's you can't. Rome wasn't built in a day. You're not going to get out of Babylon in a day. But I think that there is a way for us that want to, and I think that there's a way to do it where we're not having to sacrifice. Uh, to sacrifice like qual the quality of what life is. I think that we've actually lost even the notion of what a quality life looks like because of all of our, our ambition and hubris and pride and like our need for the recognition through whatever, you know, statuses and titles and po- titles and popularity and all that. Like there going back to the eternal would mean we'd have to be okay with less novelty, but the novelty isn't real. It's artificial. And we can always create more novelty ourselves. But when we're depending on, when we're enslaved to the novelty of this culture, the novelty of the entertainments, uh, it's, it's fake. There's nothing there. It's why you feel empty, you know, if you spend all day watching Netflix. If you spend all day creating the novelty yourself, painting pictures, that's that's the type of art that I like. That's good stuff, man. Like it's not that art is evil, but artificiality is all evil is artificial. <laughs> That's kind of where I want to leave it. It feels good. I don't know. How you doing? I've been talking a lot. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to give you a, give you a chance to let the ideas come out. And it's been, it's been a fun, it's been a, it's been a fun, like lots of ideas to consider. Um, after this conversation, but it was a good exercise to sort of, you know, decon. I feel like it was a very deconstructive conversation where, uh, especially with like the et- etymological stuff of like words. So thanks for being on again, chance. And, um, for our listeners, where can they learn more about you and your work and what you're up to these days? Well, it's interversepodcast.com for pretty much anything I'd want to point you to. I've got the show everywhere from YouTube to, you know, the alternative stuff like BitChute and brand new tube. And I've got social media profiles and everything. We've got a good discord. You can find all the links to stuff on interversepodcast.com. I've been doing video versions of the show, which is kind of fun. It's completely optional. There's nothing you're going to miss, but you know, I make like trippy visualizers to go (laughs) kaleidoscopic, gnarly, art to go behind the videos and it's really fun every week and i like when people watch it that way even if you're not like you know staring at the screen all the time that's cool i just want you to see that little bit of art i made (laughs) and on the show uh it's not like this i i do talk more than the average host maybe but uh i want to i want to bring ideas to people that are influential and already have good ideas i want to like harmonize with them I, I was doing the model of just asking questions and holding back a lot for a while there. And I know, you know, I know you've been more free form lately too, Dan, and I just didn't give you a chance to get a word in, but uh, that's fine. I, I really, no, it's all good. My, on my show, I don't usually quite go off like this. I think I might do more content in the future. I mean, who knows? The future is going to be interesting because I'm going to have a lot more time outside of the, hamster wheel once i i get get my diapers off i'm gonna be a lot more agile without that poopy diaper that i was (laughs) stuck in (laughs) but hey uh there's a lot on interverse man like it's not just this uh type of idea this is what i'm interested in that's why i appreciate having a chance to just express it because as you know as a host you don't always get to 
say everything you want to say. And if you are lucky, you remember it for your outros and intros, but a lot of that stuff kind of vanishes in the ether. And back to what I was saying about more substantive forms of art, I'd like to get into writing, I think for sure in the future. Once, uh, once I'm a little, have a little bit more time and less addicted to video games, I'm sure there's a book in the future, but I hope you guys, uh, you know, support Dan for sure, because this is a this is a genuine dude right here. You know, we're we're very kindred spirits. I I'd love it if y'all were on his Patreon, and I think you do a t- uh, second hour split too, right, dude? Uh, something like that. It's not quite a full extra hour, and um, you know, I as 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 we were kind of talking about at the beginning of the show, like Scarlet's no longer a part of this and um, I'm still feeling out what, what direction the show is going. And unfor- I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, like m- when you're talking about the hamster wheel stuff, like m- my focus has, it's not that I don't care about getting money for this. I want <laughs> money for this, but it's not, I have more of like a day job actually than than when I started this the show, but um, just like you, it would be great to grow it into something sustainable, and I and that's what I do want to do. So yeah, I I love the support on Patreon and want more, but I will say that at this point it's it's a little bit more, <laughs> just trying to get an episode out per week, give or take. Um, which is a struggle, but you know, it's, I, I caught, I caught this interview me. falls in between a nice little streak of catching up. So I'm, I'm definitely catching back up. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, as you know, like you, you know, you have a busy life yourself too. And it's the passion that keeps you, uh, showing up to keep doing the, the podcast thing for so long. Yeah. These conversations are what helped me actually have the the spiritual timeline progression and not the you know record wheel spinning round and round <laughs> yeah it's 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 very interesting cuz i am i just stepped onto another hamster wheel and and i know it's it's a nice change after being unemployed by all this 2020 bullshit. Yeah, I've been in the same office for eight years, by the way. So that's why I like getting pretty Yeah, crazy. yeah. <laughs> I know the feeling. Like, you know, like at this point, I'm not, I've only been working this new gig for like two to three months. Um, but yeah, there it, it's a great feeling to walk away and start fresh. Like I, and even just like I, I moved last year and I'm sure you're going to go through similar, um, it's just that rush of like starting something new. So I'm happy for you that, that like you said, at the end of this year, you're going to be starting something new yourself. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Yeah. Matt, imagine something new. Like it says behind my head on that interverse sign. That's the portal. That's what takes us places is uh good for good or ill. That imagination is definitely quite the tool. <laughs> and it's, it's what we got to have. We have to, reconnect to imagination imagination is spirit it's the image making faculty of spirit and the images in your mind that just naturally arise do guide us and inform our mind as to what kind of decisions we make like you know that's what empathy is you you think about what it would feel like or look like to do that thing to that person and you go oh shit i can't do that or you know whatever the case may be imagination and spirit very much Imagination is like the perceptual apparatus to to even view like the information that spirit has for you in a weird way because you're like in the middle in the mind sandwiched between the body and the spirit in this between heaven and earth existence we've got. Amen. Well, thanks again for coming on the show, Chance. And for anyone listening, definitely check out Interverse Podcast and follow Chance on social media he's got a lot of good just like memes and little (laughs) you have you have good good stories i'll say i like seeing uh some of the stuff you put up so yeah thanks again for coming on man and um i'm sure we'll talk again soon 
yeah man i've got you coming on mine uh not too long from now that's gonna be yeah fun. so well yes then we definitely will so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i appreciate it dan this has been a blast and i I like being able to express myself like this and it's energizing to uh, have the right, the right person to harmonize with, to get, to draw these ideas out of me. Like these type of conversations, I, I think thoughts I hadn't yet thought before or articulated before. And I, to me, that's like a big part of the growth. So thanks a lot, man. Yeah. That's, that's the, the gold in podcasting because it happens a lot. So I'm with you on that. All right, man. Well, thanks again and have a good night. Peace. All right, y'all. Thanks for listening to my episode with Chance Garten. Make sure to check out his show, Interverse. Um, there was a an episode where I was interviewed on Interverse that came out before the Great Conjunction. So it was out in December, and that was a really fun conversation. Um, and yeah, like I said, this recording was made back in November and it was released a little bit later just because I had some sort of current events type episodes that, that got put out earlier. And as many of you know, it is a lot of work to run a podcast, very time consuming. If you did notice, I was, <laughs> the intro was a little choppy because I s misspoke about um, Mars and Uranus. I said that originally I said that they were squaring when in fact they were conjuncting. So then I had to like go back and kind of mess with the audio and edit it. So yeah on a uh, jam-packed night with my jam-packed day job, I'm jamming this podcast in as well because you guys need your episodes. And I've got more coming out too and want to keep the show going strong. Um, so if you do want to support me, you can do so on Patreon. Uh, for just five bucks a month, you get the unedited version of these episodes. And I'm I'm considering different options for what to offer the patrons. But at the end of the day, you know, it, I just l really appreciate the support and I appreciate the listenership as well. So, um, if you want to participate in, you know, see what I'm up to on social media, Instagram, I'm at cosmic underscore keys, underscore podcast, Twitter at cosmic keys, seven, seven, seven. Uh, you can find this show on YouTube and, Obviously, if you're listening to it on some other platform. Um, and yeah, thanks for being here. And I will talk to you all next week with more Cosmic Keys. So have a great weekend. Take care. Bye.